In this session, we're going to talk about the theology of the gospel. In the first session, I gave an example of the gospel message. I said the following was one way to express the gospel. The good news is that the one and only God, who is holy, made us in his image to know him. But we sin and cut ourselves off from him. In his great love, God became a man in Jesus, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross, thus fulfilling the law himself, and taking on himself the punishment for the sins of all those who would ever turn and trust him. He rose again from the dead, showing that God accepted Christ's sacrifice and that God's wrath against us had been satisfied. He now calls on us to repent of our sins and trust in Christ alone for our forgiveness. If we repent of our sins and trust in Christ, we are born again into a new life, an eternal life with God. There were many theological points made in that statement. What we're going to do is take that piece by piece and study it. For example, we will try to understand things like the doctrine of God. God is one. God is holy. He is our creator. Why are these qualities of God important to the gospel? I will also talk about the doctrine of sin. We are separated from God because of our sin. And that we deserve the wrath of God. Why does this matter to the gospel? We will talk about the doctrine of God's love and the doctrine of the Incarnation, that is, that God became a man in Christ. Why did God have to become a man? Could an angel have died for us, or did it have to be a man? We will also be studying the doctrine of the sinlessness of Christ. Why was it necessary for Jesus to be without sin? Or the substitutionary sacrifice on the cross? How exactly did Jesus pay for our sins on the cross? What happened on the cross? What scriptures were fulfilled by this? And why does it matter to us? Also, the doctrine of the resurrection of Christ. What are some reasons that the resurrection is important? These are all questions that I want to talk about today. As I mentioned in the first session, I believe that the more that we understand about all the aspects of the gospel the better we will be able to clearly explain it to all the different people we encounter. You should be able to make a child understand the gospel just as easily as you are able to make a university professor understand it. Sometimes we only have a few moments to explain the gospel to someone, and so the more that you understand all aspects of the gospel, the better you will be able to choose which parts of the gospel that person needs to know at that moment. But, as I also mentioned in the first session, I don't think that it's necessary to have all this theological knowledge in order to preach the gospel. I simply believe that we can always improve our own understanding of the gospel, and in so doing, we will become better evangelists. I will be giving you many Bible verses during this talk, so you can study more on each of these topics. So I encourage you to get a pencil and paper if you don't already have one. Let's start with the doctrine of God. This is important because if someone does not believe in God, then none of the other parts of the gospel will mean very much to them. The first part is that God is one. There is only one true God. If the people you talk to believe in many gods, then you may have to spend some time explaining this point. Some Bible verses that show this clearly are the following. 1 Corinthians 8 verses 4 and 6. John 17, verse 3. Deuteronomy 4, verses 35 through 36. Isaiah 42, verse 8. Isaiah 44, verse 6 and 8. And Isaiah 45, verses 5 through 6. I won't spend too much time on this point, but I would encourage your further study on this if belief in many gods is something that you encounter in evangelism. The next one is very important to the gospel, the holiness of God. The angels around the throne of God constantly sing, Holy, 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 in Isaiah 6, 3, and Revelation 4, 8. The main meaning of holy is separate. 
But another aspect of God's holiness is most important to the gospel. To be holy is to be morally pure. Habakkuk tells us in the Old Testament that God's eyes are too pure to look upon evil in chapter 1, verse 13. Some other verses about the purity of God are as follows. Job 15, verse 15. Psalm 5, verse 4 through 5. Psalm 11, verse 4 through 7. Psalm 34, verse 15 through 16. 1 Peter 1, verses 15 through 16. God is holy, and because of this, He cannot tolerate evil. Even the slightest sin would prevent us from being near to God because of His holiness. In the Old Testament, God used to dwell in what was known as the Holy of Holies. This was the part of the temple where they kept the Ark of the Covenant. The Holy Spirit of God used to dwell between the cherubim on the top of the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. No one could go into the Holy of Holies except the high priest, and he could only go in once a year on the Day of Atonement in order to sprinkle the blood of the Lamb on the top of the Ark. This was to atone for the sins of the people of Israel. This blood was the blood of the Lamb. It was sprinkled on the top of the ark. The theological idea is that when God, who was dwelling on the top of the ark, looked down into the ark, he did not see the tablets of the law that were inside of the ark. But instead, when God looked down, he saw only the blood of the lamb sprinkled on the top. This is why the top of the ark is translated mercy seat. God had mercy and did not judge them for their sins, because instead of seeing the law, he saw the blood of the Lamb. Before the high priest could go into the presence of God to sprinkle this blood, he had to make sacrifices for his own sins and do many ritual cleanings, because even though he was a righteous man, he had to be totally clean from any personal sins before entering into the presence of God. It is believed that if he sinned while in the presence of God, he would die. So you see that God was and is so holy that it was dangerous for even the high priest to go into his presence. In the new covenant, God has made a way for his Holy Spirit to be in the heart of every believer. This is now possible because God no longer sees us as sinners if we are in Christ. But instead, he sees only the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, and his sinless life. We will see later, when we study the Old Testament, that God's plan was always to be able to dwell in the hearts of people and to change them from the inside out. Many prophecies in the Old Testament were about this. We will learn more about this later. Right now, my only point is that God's holiness is an important part of the gospel, because it is his holiness that prevents us from coming into his presence, because we are sinners. In other words, we are separated from God because he is holy and we are sinful. The next point about the doctrine of God is that he is our creator. If God truly is our creator, then we owe him our lives. We would not even exist without him. We are designed to love him. Isaiah 43 verse 7 says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him, yes, I have made him. We are created for God's glory, Isaiah says. This makes our rebellion against God even more terrible. A few verses you might want to write down about this are Psalm 139, verse 14, Isaiah 43, verse 7, Ephesians 2, verse 10, Ephesians 4, verse 24, and Genesis 1, verse 26 through 27. So God being our creator can be an important part of the gospel. There is much more about the doctrine of God that we could talk about. But for the sake of time, 
we will move on to the next one. The Doctrine of Sin Probably the most important part of sin is that it separates us from God because of His holiness. Sin caused Adam and Eve to have to leave the Garden of Eden. And it also causes us to be separated from God. Let's turn to Isaiah 59, verse 2. It says, But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden His face from you, so that He will not hear. Part of the reason that sin separates us from God is because God is a perfect judge, which means that He must righteously judge sin. We all want our earthly judges to be good judges. If the judge here in Eldoret was not a good judge, it would be dangerous for the community. For example, let's say that a person came into your friend's house and murdered his entire family, and you caught him in the act, and you tied him up. You called the police, and they took him to this judge, and the judge said, Because I am such a loving judge, I will let this person go. You would be very angry. You would say, This judge is worse than the criminals. He does not punish crimes at all. He is a terrible judge. We want our judges to judge righteously. We want them to punish criminals. If they do not do this, the community is in danger. We also want God to punish sinners. We know that if He is a perfect judge, He must give perfect justice for every sin. But this is a problem for us. Because, as Romans chapter 3 tells us, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all separated from God because we are all sinners. But God is also loving, and He doesn't desire anyone to perish. That is exactly why Christ had to die. Jesus provided a way for God to remain a good judge and provided a way for God to punish all sins ever committed, as well as a way to satisfy God's wrath against sinners. But it also allowed him a way to forgive sinners. Let's turn to Romans chapter 3, verse 25, because it explains this point very well. Verse 25 starts out, and it's talking about Jesus. It says, Whom God has set forth as a propitiation by his blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The word propitiation means to satisfy God's wrath for sins. The sins of the entire world were put on Jesus at the cross. This was God's way of making sure all the sins of the world are punished. It is by the payment for all sin being made that we are no longer separated from God, if we repent and believe in the gospel. What happened on the cross then? What was in the cup that Jesus drank at Calvary? Let's turn to Luke 22, verse 42. This is Jesus the night before he was to be crucified. He was in great distress because he knew what the next day would bring. Luke, who was a doctor, tells us that he sweat blood in verse 44. We now know that sweating blood is possible, and it's a condition that can happen when a person is extremely stressed. Verse 42 says, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. So, was Jesus afraid of the Roman crucifixion or the beatings that he would receive? Is this what was in the cup that he didn't want to drink if God would allow it? No, not at all. Many Christians in the early church would go to an even worse torture than Jesus endured. We have records in church history of men singing as they went to be burned alive because of the privilege of being killed for the name of Christ. No, Jesus was not concerned about the beatings or the Roman cross. 